Welcome to Public Health On Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Our focus is the novel coronavirus. I'm Josh Sharfstein, a faculty member at Johns Hopkins and also a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal with this podcast is to bring evidence and experts to help you understand today's news about the novel coronavirus and what it means for tomorrow. If you have questions, you can email them to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, Stephanie Desmond speaks to Dr. Dori Segev, a transplant surgeon and researcher at Johns Hopkins. They talk about the impact that COVID-19 is having on patients who are on the kidney transplant waiting list and how concerned he is about the massive slowdown in transplants during the pandemic. Let's listen. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. Good morning. If you have kidney failure, what are your options? Your options are either to be uh, on dialysis or be on the transplant waiting list. So how is COVID affecting this? Right. So COVID has impacted pretty much every option for somebody with kidney failure. You know, if you have kidney failure, you need treatment for that, regardless of what is happening in the healthcare system. There are about 600,000 people in the United States with kidney failure who are reliant on renal replacement therapy, and that would either be dialysis or transplantation. So if you think most of them are on dialysis because we don't have enough organs. So as a side note, I would ask anyone listening to register as an organ donor because we need more organ donors at any time in this world. <laughs> but if you're, if you're on dialysis, you need to go three days a week to a dialysis center. And you know everybody across the country is staying at home for fear of getting infected with coronavirus, ending up with COVID-19 disease and, you know, being at risk of dying. And so, you know, people are staying at home, avoiding even the store or the park, yet people with kidney failure have to go to a dialysis center and they have to go three times a week. And dialysis centers tend to be relatively crowded. There's a ton of patients there and a ton of healthcare workers there taking care of the patients. Very hard to avoid very hard to practice social distancing and avoid risks of viral transmission at a dialysis center. And in addition, the people who are on dialysis are also at higher risk for the impact of COVID-19 should they get it, because those with comorbidities, such as kidney failure, um, are at higher risk of dying if they get the infection. So they're at higher risk of catching the infection because of the conditions, inevitable conditions of receiving dialysis three times a week and the immunosuppressed state that you are in with kidney failure. And then they are at higher risk of more severe impact of COVID-19 should they happen to acquire it. My 89-year-old father-in-law goes for dialysis three times a week. And at one point he was afraid to go. And I had to tell him that he was definitely going to die if he didn't go for dialysis, but that hopefully he wouldn't die from COVID if he went. Yeah, it's scary. You have to go or, you know, your kidneys don't function and that's inevitable death. But it's scary for people who are on dialysis who know that they're at higher risk to go to the dialysis center three times a week. I'm very scared for the dialysis population right now. So the other group are folks who are very high on the transplant list, which I understand that the transplant list has been shrinking? Well, so there are about 100,000 people waiting for a kidney transplant in the United States. They are on dialysis. They are waiting for a kidney transplant. For that group, COVID-19 has also been a bit of a disaster because we are doing far fewer transplants in the United States right now because of this disease. Obviously, there are a number of worries, some of which are directly related to transplantation and some of which are indirectly related to transplantation. The first worry directly related to transplantation is that if we transplant somebody, now we really have to immunosuppress them. So now this puts them at much higher risk of acquiring diseases such as 
coronavirus and possibly puts them at higher risk of dying from the disease should they acquire it, although this is not yet known. One of the biggest problems is that we're having to make these life and death decisions for people based on very, very little data. We really don't know if people who get a transplant are at higher risk of acquiring the disease or at higher risk of dying from the disease. We just don't know. But there's this worry, obviously, that that would be the case. You know, if we transplant somebody, we suppress their immune system, and now we're going to get them into trouble. And, you know, now we've not done them any service by, by any means. The other worries are that when we do an operation on somebody, we take up an operating room and a ventilator. And then after the operation, they take up a hospital bed. And if they did well, they won't be in an ICU. But if they didn't do well or if they have any complications, they might end up in an ICU, again, taking up hospital resources. And people are worried that, you know, they're worried about taking up hospital resources that should be saved for patients with COVID-19 that then are going to be taken up by transplant recipients. As a result, the impact on transplantation in the United States has been dramatic. And you can see if you look at transplant numbers over time, around March 15th, there was a huge change with somewhere on the order of about 20 to 30 percent decrease in deceased donor transplants and nearly complete pause in living donor transplants. Again, these are difficult decisions for patients. So for example, if we are trying to decide whether we should transplant somebody, you know, we have to think about the hospital resources and then we have to think about the risk of leaving them on dialysis versus the risk of putting them through a transplant and sending them out into the community immunosuppressed at risk for COVID. And that risk benefit equation is different across the country based on sizes of waiting lists, based on COVID incidents and prevalence right now, based on available hospital resources, and also based on the patient. For example, if the patient is at the very top of the waiting list and we think the pandemic will subside in two months, then we delay that patient by two months. If the patient is three years down the waiting list and we think that the pandemic will subside in a year, now we delay that patient by four years. Who has an offer today? And it could be quite possible that what we should be doing is transplanting people a little bit lower down on the list who would benefit more from the transplant now that would offset any potential risks that they're taking. We've done two major research studies on this. One is to figure out what the impact has been center by center across the country. And I just kind of summarized that for you. And the other is to actually use statistical modeling to help centers make these decisions using a simulation. So the simulation can take things we know from all sorts of data sources like the National Transplant Registry and things like that, and can make certain assumptions about the pandemic and how long the pandemic will last and things like that, and let the user kind of vary those assumptions. And then we'll tell you for this patient, this is what we think their survival curve would look like if we waited, and this is what we think their survival curve would look like if we transplanted them immediately. And what we're hoping is that by disseminating that, we can help transplant centers make those decisions driven by data more than driven by worries. Because in a simulation, you can say things like, okay, well, what if the infection rate were 10 times higher than we think it is? How would that impact the, you know, the effect of transplanting on this patient, et cetera? And people can vary those things and they can say, wow, really, even in the worst case scenario that I'm imagining, this patient would still benefit by being transplanted today. And so we're hoping that that will change. You asked about the size of the waiting list. So one of the things that has happened is that when people don't want to do deceased donor transplants or don't want to do them on a certain subset of their list, they inactivate that list. And one of the things that we've seen is there are some reports that more than half of the waiting list right now has been turned inactive, which means they're not even 
considering organ offers. If you're inactive, you don't get organ offers. And so it means that the bottom line is that, you know, as of March 15th, the impact on solid organ transplantation in this country, and in particular on kidney transplantation, has been a dramatic decrease. There are a lot of people dying of COVID, as we know, by some accounts, the leading cause of death in the United States right now. Can you use organs that have been from a patient who has died of COVID? Nobody knows this. There are some thoughts that it would be reasonable if the infection were limited to the lungs to be using organs like kidney and liver from from donors who tested positive for COVID. And some people think that there is still a risk of transmitting that disease to the recipient, and no one really knows. I would say our bigger challenge in transplantation is to, to reopen our field in general, to do transplants, period, rather than trying to expand this to transplants from people who are COVID positive. Now we have testing, so we can quite reliably test whether we think a donor is at risk of transmitting coronavirus to the recipient. And so what we really need to do is figure out how we can make sure that the organs that are even COVID negative organs, which is the the overwhelming majority right now, to make sure that those organs get used. Because here's the thing, it might feel like, well, we're just turning down this one organ for this one patient right now. It's not a big deal. We'll wait. The pandemic will end, and then we'll be back to where we were. But every time we take an organ that could be used for somebody, and we don't use it, and we basically put it in the trash, there is one person on our waiting list who will not get transplanted and who will die waiting for an organ, period. Because we have taken an organ that somebody on the waiting list could have had, and we've not used that organ. And that's my big concern is, sure, in if I were in New York City right now on a waiting list, I would not want to be transplanted because I wouldn't want to be anywhere near a hospital, and I wouldn't want to increase my chances of getting COVID-19 by any factor. But if I were in most of the country, I think it's reasonable to transplant people because most of the country is not seeing such overwhelming incidents of disease that the hospitals can't handle it and need every single bed available to them for COVID-19 patients. And so one of the things that we need to figure out as a transplant community is how to efficiently move organs from areas that are probably too involved with COVID-19 right now to support most transplantation to areas that could use those organs so that we don't discard organs at all. We may just have to shift them around a little bit. And are efforts being made to do that? There are efforts. You know, the a lot of the the shifting around of organs in the United States is left to sort of a combination of UNOS, which is the United Network for Organ Sharing, which handles organ allocation policy, and the organ procurement organizations, the OPOs, who handle the donors themselves. The OPOs have their own share of challenges right now. For example, a lot of hospitals won't even let the OPO staff come in to talk to a potential donor's family about donation because, again, you know, most hospitals don't allow visitors and there's all sorts of uh, restrictions there. But some clever OPOs have created remote systems to, you know, monitor the patients, the potential donor's medical situation and to deal with the hospital staff remotely and to have remote conversations with potential donor families and things like that. So there are some OPOs who are being very creative and being very successful in weathering the storm and continuing organ donation and then trying to move these organs to other regions that are more, let's say, open for transplantation right now. Dori Segev, this has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Thank you for listening to Public Health on Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Please send questions to be covered in future podcasts to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. 
This podcast is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Lamare Morales. Audio production by Niall Owen McCusker and Spencer Greer, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.